morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm just lovely to be able to join with you together on a Sunday morning. Um, we now have a sense of um, looking forward to some kind of freedom with, with our lockdown. I know we've all been in lockdown for such a long time and we're all now looking a little bit different. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's wonderful that we actually have some date to look forward to for when we can go out and see loved ones <coughs> out of town. Um, so we're just waiting to hear when we can actually um, see all of you together. Um, so, um, so we're hopeful that will come soon. Um, and I think Auckland has done such a, a wonderful effort to get you know our vaccination rates up so high. Um, so you know we just have to thank all of you to just encourage people to go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, so um, it's been an interesting few months, and we've just been blessed to be able to still be connected on Zoom. Um, our ladies group has, um, you know, has made us do some exercise. So twice a week, we are looking forward to our little Pilates classes in the morning. And um, yeah, something that I wouldn't do myself normally during the week. <laughs> so that's, that's been really great. Um, and I think um, with a sort of sense of freedom, I know, um, you know, we're looking at Paul's journey and we know that, you know, Paul was once lost and is now found. And so, um, for us, for our freedom, is that you know we have Christ in our lives, and and what a what an incredible freedom it is, what a joy it is to be able to just um, love um, and trust God and and everything that happens, especially nowadays, really, when there's so much anxiety and um, you know um, really such concern for the future, um, and everyone's plans have all change. You know, we've just had <coughs> um, my brother's just had a recent sort of health issue, you know, and he's just really, um, yeah, looking at, um, you know, how his life will change, you know, so, yeah, so just, um, yeah, so it's just really good to really have that hope in Christ, and that's that's where our freedom comes from, we are just assured of, um, um, <clears throat> you know, our salvation and, um, and our eternal life. Um, so let's just um, read Psalm, Psalm 138. Um, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple. I will praise your name um, and for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and um, stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, um, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the, sorry, glasses, in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Thank you. Right, let's just um, bow our heads in prayer. Mm, Almighty God, what a what a privilege it is just to be able to really just gather together um, in, in this new technology, Lord of Zoom, and just to really to have fellowship together, Lord. And we just really thank you that you're an almighty God, Lord, that, um, that you just watch over us, Lord, that we can trust in you. Uh, Lord, we, we know that you have great compassion and mercy, Father God, and you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us, Lord. And we just look at your creation and we just are uh, overwhelmed by its beauty um, in spite of all the troubles that we um, can be in, Lord. So we just really um, just draw together now um, as um, one body, one church united um, in Christ, Lord, and we just um, worship you, Lord. Just um, let us lift um, our um, hearts and hands to you in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This next song is The Kingdom Is Yours. Oh, my. 
Listen to the wounded. Listen to the wounded ones in mourning. Brave enough to show the Lord this God. Blessed are the hurts that are not dead. Open to the healing touch of God. The kingdom. commit my life 
day by day as a living sacrifice. Who am I that you would care for me? I glorify the one who died for me. Glorify. 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 Let your name be lifted up and glorified. Let the earth tremble at your name. Let your name be lifted up and glorified. 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 Let your name be lifted up and glorified. Let the earth tremble at your name. Let your name be lifted up and glorified. Lord, I come. Lord, I come to your holy place. Stand in awe of your cleansing grace who am i that you would care for me i glorify the one who died for me we continue um our study on acts um, um we just look forward to what andrew is um, going to bring before the table um, so as we continue looking at Paul's journey, um, we can just see um, how this really helped to spread the gospel throughout much of the ancient world. Um, so he traveled more than 10,000 miles um, and, he, um, and he established at least 14 churches. Um, so God commanded Paul to do two things. Um, one, to be a minister, to be a servant of the things he had seen and, and to be um, um, a servant of the things that Jesus was going to reveal to her, him later. Um, and he also called him to be a witness, um, to um, be a witness to all the things that he had experienced and, um, <clears throat> and to show people by his life experience. Um, so, yeah, so just um, I think that just really speaks to each one of us. You know, um, we, we're called to be ministers, to um, um, share um, the gospel <clears throat> for people around us in our work um, and our families. I um, mean, really to, you know, one of my friends said, you know, sometimes it's hard being amongst our Christians. And she said, just be, you know, be who you are, live your life as Christ would want you to live. Um, so sometimes we don't need to say the words. We need to just be in Christ. Um, yeah, so that was really encouraging because sometimes it can be quite a long journey. You can be walking with your non-Christian friends for a long, long time and feel that you're not making much impact. Um, but we need to let God do the work and know that we're doing as well. Um, so, yeah, so let's just, um, you know, be encouraged by Paul's journey and, um, and you know, <clears throat> what Andrew's going to share with us later on. Um, yeah, so as, um, as he said, he was, um, you know, Paul was, said he was once lost, but now he is found. Right, let us pray. All right, okay. Father God, we just really, really thank you for, um, for your word, Lord, and for, for the, um, power of the Holy Spirit to keep us teachable and Lord we just really thank you for your covering um, during this um, COVID time Lord and we just really know that you have a plan and a purpose for all of us as a church Father God and our community you've placed us and positioned us in a, in a situation for us to be able to, <coughs> to testify <coughs> testify your goodness <coughs> excuse me um, and Lord as we just um, yeah as we just think of the past week and few months Lord we just really think of those that have recently lost loved ones, Lord, we just really commit um, their families into your care, Lord. We just um, <clears throat> we just ask that you just um, comfort them in this very sad time, Lord. And we just um, know that um, that you know you care for each and every one of us, Lord. And and you know um, this grief really breaks your heart too, Father God. So we just really pray for just a peace to be upon those families, Lord, um, and that, <clears throat> that you will just comfort them in their time of mourning. And Lord, we just pray for those that are, um, um, have illnesses, for those that are challenged by COVID, 
um, for those that are in isolation and um, experiencing loneliness and anxiety, Father God, um, we just really pray for your healing hand to be upon them all. Um, Lord, for those that are dealing with financial um, situations, with um, loss of jobs um, and uncertainty <coughs> for finance in the future, Father God, um, we just really just pray for, um, for, for security in you, Lord, for knowing you as our greatest security, Father God, our greatest assurance and uh, keeping steadfast. Um, and we just uh, pray for those that are sitting exams, Lord, um, and then um, those that are looking for jobs, just finishing university. Um, we, we know these, uh, you know, we just pray it's, it's an uncertain time for everyone because everything is so different, Lord, but we just really pray for strength. Um, that you will just um, help these these um, <coughs> kids to just walk through this journey, um, to navigate this new course, Lord. Um, and we just really pray for the building, Lord. We just know that um, that things are beginning to happen, Lord. We look forward to February as um, the building starts again. Father, we just um, pray for um, covering for um, the future for ACPC, Lord, that the steps will be ordered according to your will. And Father, we just um, thank you for the generous donations, Lord. We're just overwhelmed by really the, just the generosity of people that are um, you know, just so behind this vision that you've cast before ACPC. And Lord, as we, um, yeah, we just think of all the um, Sunday school children, we just really thank you for those that are just really nurturing, keeping them you know, bound in you, Lord, and, and just really encouraged by you know the commitment um, of all the Sunday school teachers to just really just care for those kids Father God and we just pray for the fellowship to stay connected um, and rooted in you and Lord as um, we listen to Andrew's um, message Father God we just really pray um, and thank you for your Holy Spirit just to um, reach out to each and every one of us in Jesus name we pray amen
Good morning everyone. It's uh, great to be with you again and uh, looking forward to uh, getting back together as soon as we possibly can. Thank you uh, Glenda for sharing about uh, just the challenge that we have like Paul being a witness telling our story to friends and colleagues and family. It is a challenge isn't it but uh, one that we uh, we want to persevere with because it is so important and today we're going to receive some encouragement um, on that very topic. Well we left Paul um, farewelling the Ephesian elders on the coast there and heading to a very uncertain future in Jerusalem and uh, he arrives in Jerusalem and I'm going to get Con Campbell now to uh, share with us what happens next because I think he summarizes it really well so I'll hand it over to him. I love being at this, to scale, replica of the Second Temple, Jerusalem. The Jerusalem of the first century, Jesus' Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem of Paul. It's really amazing to be able to visualize it this way. And what I'm struck by is how huge the temple is and how it just dominates the entire landscape. Now Paul, when he came to Jerusalem for the last time, went once again for the last time to the temple and he went there to pray. But some Jews from Asia Minor, from present day Turkey, that kind of area, recognized him because he had become infamous in that region from preaching in the synagogues and so on. They recognized him and they gathered a large crowd together saying, this man preaches against our law and against this place meaning the temple, everywhere. And so a riot ensues within the temple courts. The riot now drags Paul out of the temple through these doors into this public area. And here is an open space where more and more people can join in. The mob it becomes violent and they are trying to kill Paul. Now word is sent up to the Roman commander about what is taking place. The Roman barracks, the Antonia barracks, are on the other side of the temple complex and these four towers give an excellent view into the temple complex, no doubt so the Romans can keep an eye on potential trouble within the temple and also to impose Roman authority over this significant place. So the Roman commander comes down, he brings troops with him and they pull Paul out of trouble they drag him around the corner to the right, along the western wall, and up to safety in the barracks. As they're going up the steps, Paul asks the commander if he could be allowed to address the crowd. Paul is given permission and he speaks to them in Aramaic and they listen. And at this point, Paul recounts his whole life and testimony, how he was born a Jew, in Tarsus, Cilicia, how he came to Jerusalem and studied under the feet of Gamaliel, how he became a persecutor of the followers of Jesus, and how he encountered the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. As he's telling his story, he gets to the point where Jesus tells Paul that he will speak in Jesus' name to the Gentiles far and wide. And it's at this point that the crowd has had enough. So the crowd erupts into a riot again and the Romans take Paul inside the barracks. Once inside the fortress of Antonia, they tied Paul up in order to whip him, to flog him. At which point Paul says, is it lawful for you to flog a Roman citizen without a trial? All of a sudden they have a problem on their hands. They're not really sure what the charges are against him, what the problem is. So the Roman commander decides to convene a special meeting of the temple leadership, the chief priests and the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin met in this two-story complex built on the southern wall of the temple. When Paul addresses the Sanhedrin, he refers to them as brothers, and he refers to himself as a Pharisee born of Pharisees. And I just find it fascinating that he 
still refers to himself as a Pharisee after all these years. He says that he is on trial for his hope in the resurrection of the dead. Now, not only is that true in a good summary of his preaching, but it's also a clever ploy on Paul's part because he knows that the Sanhedrin consists of both Pharisees and Sadducees, and the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's why they're sad, you see. So a bit of a commotion breaks out, a dispute between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Paul is once again endangered, and he is escorted back away from the Sanhedrin into the Roman barracks. The Roman commander decides that Paul needs to appear before Governor Felix in Caesarea. Wow, that uh, model of Jerusalem is pretty cool, isn't it? I wonder if you've uh, been there and seen the model for yourself. Notice a couple of things from the video. People were right to be concerned about Paul going to Jerusalem. It reminds me of the bishop who said, wherever Paul went, they started a riot. Wherever I go, they serve tea. And certainly there was a riot again when Paul came to Jerusalem. Notice that Paul asks <clears throat> the Roman uh, guy in charge, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? What? A Roman citizen? You see, being a Roman citizen was a really big deal. And Paul didn't just have to earn it or buy it. He was born a Roman citizen. That was pretty special. And so the rights of citizenship meant that he was entitled to a fair trial and not death at a hand in the hands of a lynch mob. Notice also that he brings up that old chestnut, that issue of the resurrection of the dead, which was a big theological issue which divided the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And uh, it was a very clever idea to uh, kind of get the Pharisees on side at that particular time, um, even if it was temporary, uh, so that they could fight with one another rather than with him over that issue. After a plot is uncovered to assassinate Paul, he is spirited away up the coast to Caesarea. Caesarea pops up from time to time in the New Testament, but I particularly uh, associated with associate it with that famous conversation between Peter and Jesus and the other disciples where Peter declares to Jesus you are the Christ the son of the living God <clears throat> well after all the excitement of the book of Acts so far we are now faced with three what I call show trials where Paul gives a defense of his ministry it does seem somewhat anticlimactic doesn't it but we must remember why Luke wrote this book. In fact, both books, his Gospel and the Book of Acts. He wrote to make a case before the most excellent Theophilus, who was probably judging his case in Rome. And in that context, the conversations here would have been very important evidence for Paul's character and his innocence. First of all, we have Felix. Felix was the younger brother of one of the richest men in Rome. He had recently been recalled to Rome because of his cruelty to the people he was in charge of. Hmm. He had uh, won the role of governor of Judea in 52 AD because he had married a relative of Emperor Claudius. But two years later, when Claudius died, he dumped her and then went with a girl, woman, Drusilla, much younger than him. She was the beautiful married sister of King Agrippa. In fact, the historian, the Roman historian Tacitus, accused Philip Felix of indulging in every kind of barbarity and lust, exercising the authority of a king with the mind of a slave. He wasn't a particularly nice fellow. Certainly his character wasn't. So when Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come with Felix, you can imagine he would have been somewhat 
squirming in his seat, so his response is not surprising. That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. You can find that in Acts 24.1. And he leaves Paul, languishing in prison for two years, until Felix is replaced by Festus. Festus is a more virtuous replacement as governor. He wanted to do the Jews a favour, so he asks Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? Now, what do you think? Do you think this would have been a good idea for Paul to go down to Jerusalem and face the Jews? Some Jews who were so utterly committed to getting rid of Paul and doing away with his heretical teaching that earlier on they'd made a vow that they would not eat or drink until he was killed. Probably not the safest place for Paul to go. Even today, if you have a trial and you're looking for an impartial jury, there is sometimes you need to go to somewhere else. And Paul knows he's much better off somewhere else. Um, now, one of the things that is very helpful here is understanding the Jewish fear, if you like, around Paul. You see, when the Romans conquered Palestine, they quickly realised that the Jews, who would not give up their God for the Babylonians, the Persians, or the Seleucids, these are the guys who came after Alexander the Great, were not about to change their mind for the Romans. And so, very sensibly, Julius Caesar granted Judaism the status of religio licita, a permitted religion to be tolerated alongside the Roman gods. Sounds good, but there was a big but to it. In order to maintain this accommodation, the Jews had to keep their religion to themselves. To live a quiet life and forsake their national mandate to be a light to the nations. So whenever there was a, result, a revolt or a threat to this relationship between the Romans and the Jews, the guys in charge, religious and political, think Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin especially, got very nervous. And this helps explain the background of both Jesus' trial and crucifixion and Paul's trials, so-called trials, and imprisonment. Could the Christians follow a similar strategy of accommodation with the Romans? Yes and no. They certainly wouldn't go out of their way to deliberately antagonise the Romans. They made excellent citizens. They cared for the poor, the sick and the needy. They worked hard. They obeyed the law. But they, you know, when they were being good Christians, let's face it, I'm sure they weren't perfect. But they had this huge worldview, this huge worldview that encompassed all of life. As Abraham Kuyper, many years later, said he was the Prime Minister of the Netherlands in 1905 to 19, 1901 to 1905, said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, my and that did not necessarily sit very well with megalomaniac Roman emperors as they increasingly became, as the empire kind of fizzled. They got crazier as they went along. In fact, the emperor Domitian declared Christianity a religio illicita, a, an illegal religion some 20 years later. So Paul wisely does not want to go to Jerusalem and appeals to Caesar. Verse 12, chapter 25. After Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. And then King Agrippa and Bernice arrive. And they are interested in meeting this prisoner Paul that they've heard some stuff about and uh, hearing what he's got to say. At this point, it might be a helpful thing to have a small lesson in the Herods of the Bible because it's like which Herod is this one? How many Herods are there? Because they're not all the same one. There's four main ones in the New Testament that we need to know about. There's Herod the Great. He was made ruler 
of Judea in BC 37. And he is famous for um, really expanding the second temple there and many other architectural marvels um, in, the, in the area. He was the one who ordered the murder of the innocents, those boys under two in Bethlehem that we uh, will be uh, thinking about soon in our Christmas season. Then there's Herod Antipas. He became Herod Tetrarch, as they called them, of Galilee and ruled throughout Jesus' ministry. He divorced his wife to marry Herodias, who was formerly the wife of his half-brother. And John the Baptist condemned this and as a result ended up um, tragically being killed and beheaded at the, uh, at the um, behest of Herodias, who really wanted to shut him up. He also questioned Jesus early on uh, that Friday um, on the day of his crucifixion. Herod Agrippa was Herod the Great's grandson and Herod Antipas's nephew. He had James beheaded in Acts chapter 12. He was the one who was eaten by worms and died. And then Herod Agrippa II was the son of Herod Agrippa. He had been a 17-year-old courtier, courtier in the uh, palace of the Roman Emperor Claudius when he heard of his father's death. And after 15 years of scheming, because it wasn't automatic, he became ruler of Galilee. Bernice was his lover as well as his sister. But he eventually had to let her go because the rumours swirling around their relationship just made it uh, impossible for it to continue. Um, she became, interestingly enough, the mistress of the Roman general Titus, who was very famous for, among other things, destroying Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. <clears throat> so, verse 23. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. What a sight they must have been. Rulers love to look important, don't they? But who really has the power? The book of Acts reminds us that kings may swagger and they may hold sway. But the ruler of the universe is building his kingdom. As, uh, as Anthony sang earlier in this uh, broadcast, he is building his kingdom through his church. That's you and I. So I'd invite now Janet to uh, bring our reading for today as we look at this exchange between Paul and Agrippa and Bernice. So take it away, Janet. Hi, good morning. Today's reading is in Acts chapter 26, verse 12 to 32. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa and I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, So, so, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the ghost. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that I should <clears throat> I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. 
So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people, to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, you sh he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. Paul replied, what I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time alone I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those who those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. May God bless the reading and understanding of his word. Thank you, Janet. Well, as he has done previously, Paul begins by explaining his former life as a strict Jew and a Pharisee who persecuted the church. He is not opposed to the Jewish teaching, heritage, way of life, all of that commands he takes pains to stress. But something happened to Paul when he was on the road to Damascus to persecute some Christians. What happened? He met Jesus. Verse 18 is such a cool summary of the gospel, isn't it? That uh, Jesus gives to, to uh, Paul to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I think Jesus has been reading Paul, or probably the other way around there. It has the sense of what God has done for us, rescuing and forgiving us in Christ, plus what he is continuing to do for us, sanctifying us by faith in him. This is a beautiful summary of what salvation is all about. It's not just a one and done deal, tick, I'm saved, but an ongoing journey of becoming like Jesus. As Paul says in Colossians 1, 28 and 29, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. This was Paul's passion, passion and it must be ours as well. That's why the church exists. That's why we are instantly beamed up to heaven. Because we have a job to do, to be the good news that we share and to share the good news that we are, the good news about Jesus. As uh, Glenda said, to let our lives and our lips synchronize together so that people will be drawn to the Saviour. Now, this is not a piece of cake. It's not easy in our own strength. It's impossible. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be growing as Christ's disciples and ambassadors. As Paul is sharing the mission that Jesus has given to him, Festus and, and uh, particularly about the Messiah and the promises that he will uh, die and rise again, Festus interrupts him. He's still in the room. <clears throat> he hasn't left. You are out of your mind, Paul. He shouted, your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, 
and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. Today people think that Christians are out of their mind. They might not say it, but they think it often, for believing in a crucified and resurrected Messiah who is coming again to reign. But as I read Paul's testimony and the historical detail of these trials, I wonder how can anyone think that this is made up? These things were not done in a corner. They were observed by many people, the great and the small alike. The issue is not did it happen, because it did. This is historical fact, friends. In fact, there is more evidence of the events surrounding Jesus' life, death and resurrection and the growth, the explosive growth of the early church than the fact that, Jesus, that Julius Caesar existed. And no one disputes that. The issue is, as it always is, the heart. Paul answers Festus simply and clearly. He doesn't get defensive, he doesn't throw a punch verbally or otherwise, because he wants to hone in on Agrippa, who might just be a bit more open to the message than Festus is. So he asks him, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a small, short, small, short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. If this is true, which I believe it is, then what is our response? Do we really believe it? I'm sure most of you will say, yes, of course. But how is the wonder and urgency of the gospel affecting our lives personally today? Is it making a difference? I've been reading through Exodus lately, another series that um, I'm planning on for next year as we continue the story from Exodus onwards. So you've already heard about Galatians, now there's a series on Moses. In one scene, the people have been delivered from slavery across the Red Sea, through the Red Sea, and they're in the wilderness and they've come to the foot of Mount Sinai and God's presence has come down on the mountain. This cloud and thunder and lightning and trumpets, it is a sensory overload to be sure. And Moses writes, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Mark Buchanan, a Vancouver based pastor, writes about this passage. This is primal fear, the voice of God, the presence of God, holds not comfort but terror. We fear God the way we fear tigers and tyrants, cyclones and cyclopses, a power swift and capricious. So we want it muffled, mediated, caged. We settle for no demand, echoes, rumours, shadows. We long for hearsay about God, but do not ourselves want to hear God say anything. Mm. Fascinating quote, isn't it? So here's a question for you today. Are you tempted, even a little bit, to keep God and his plans for your life at arm's length? Are you worried that he might get you to do stuff you don't want to do if you fully surrender to him? Is being safe more important than being holy? If you can relate to the Israelites, then you're in good company. I think we can all relate, can't we? I like my creature comforts. Full-on obedience seems costly and somewhat inconvenient. I'm sure challenged by Paul's laser focus. Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. So how can I, and you, and we, have that same attitude, that desire, that commitment, 
that confidence that everyone needs Jesus and we have a part to play in ensuring that that happens. First of all, friends, we must feed on God's word for ourselves. As he says, people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. For many of us, this lockdown period has given us a little bit more flexibility to take time to read God's word rather than rushing out for the big commute. Maybe there's a bit more time morning or evening or even lunchtime, if, uh, especially if the, uh, the one o'clock briefing's not on, and even if it is. If that hasn't been your habit, it is never too late to start. And don't have to start here. You can start here with a short amount of time. I've sent a link to a reading guide for this Advent season. Download it. Read the passage, read the devotional. If you like, you can answer the questions. Look at the lovely pictures. It's cool. It starts next Sunday at the beginning of Advent, goes right through to Christmas, and then jumps over to Epiphany on the 6th of January. So really nice reading. Interestingly, it starts with the second coming because that's what Advent does. It's the looking forward and we can pretend to look forward to Christmas, but really we're looking forward to the second coming. And so that's that's an interesting way that traditionally Advent goes. So, so I hope you get into that. Secondly, so first of all, Bible. Secondly, talk to God. As you would have seen on the notices, I'm starting the prayer course this Tuesday from 7.30. It's only an hour-ish, and uh, it's four weeks before Christmas, four weeks after the holidays, and uh, it's going to be great. And uh, Rachel's helping me with it. I've already got two people signed up, so I just need another four would be good, or 14. doesn't really matter. You can have lots of people on Zoom. I was on a Zoom call with 377 people on Thursday morning. <laughs> so that was fun. I was trawling through the participants. Oh, who do I know in this group? <clears throat> we don't need that many because we want to have a little bit of a conversation as well as the video and the teaching. Do you know the disciples could have asked Jesus about anything for teaching on anything? Help us to do this. Help us to um, preach a good sermon. I love his parables. Help me to be really good at using normal things to tell a good story. Or help me to cast out demons or to heal the sick. They could have asked anything. What did they ask Jesus to teach them to do? You probably know. Lord, teach us to pray. So uh, get into it. There's some really practical things in this course. In fact, each week we do a practical thing um, to help us uh, explore and develop our prayer life. Email me, andrewcox, at acpc.org.nz to join in. So read the Bible, pray. This is pretty familiar territory, isn't it? And thirdly, overflow. As you grow in your walk with Jesus, as you have korero with him, conversation, respond with action. Do the mahi. We've been hearing about doing the mahi quite a lot. And we have been doing the mahi, haven't we? The work in, in, in these lockdowns. Share your story with others, as Glenda mentioned, like Paul did. Make this your motto in the motu. A few um, Te Reo words today. Your motto in the motu. Motu is island. This is where we live, the island, the North Island and New Zealand. Make this your motto. Here it is. What will I do in 22? Or maybe what can be done in 21? Uh, the year's not over. We've still got a month, a month to go. We could pack a lot into this month, couldn't we? We probably will. I tell you, we are in for such an exciting year next year. If we grow up in Jesus and move out in his strength, we will welcome in many people to 25 Union Street and grow up in Jesus and move out and then welcome in and so on. Well, it seems that Agrippa was unwilling to get to grips with following Jesus. Like Felix and Festus, he vacillated, procrastinated, and abdicated responsibility. He put off making a decision to follow Christ, and in so doing missed out completely. He would later die childless 
as the last of Herod's dynasty. Let us not make the same mistake, spiritually speaking. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favour I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the day of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. So, what will you do today? Thank you so much for being part of our service today. Um, we will be together again as the as this song uh, goes. But in the meantime, we continue online. Next week, we finish the book of Acts. I know we've really been going fast on it the last couple of weeks, but um, we want to get to uh, into December and focus on Advent, which means the season of preparation for Christmas, when God becomes a human being. So that will be very, very special. So, um, as I mentioned, prayer course Tuesday night. Check it out. I uh, would love to have you there. And uh, download the Advent devotional reading questions, etc. Uh, ASAP and begin that next Sunday. Well, let's uh, conclude with that prayer that we've been praying um, each week for the last couple of months, really. And uh, if you're like me, you tend to uh, forget it. I still haven't quite remembered it all. You'd think I would. It's, it's not that difficult. Um, but we've got the words here so you can read it with me and, uh, and we can pray together. So let's pray. Father, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.